Hey, good morning. Um, I think we're going to get ourselves started here. Um, welcome. My name is Omar Khan, and I'm a professor and the head of school of architecture at Carnegie Mellon University. I'm also one of the organizers of the Architectural Ceramic Assemblies Workshop, or ACAL. Uh, just some housekeeping as we begin. Uh, for all the attendees, uh, please use the chat window to ask questions of speakers. Uh, we have found this to be a useful technique uh, to sort of, uh, as, as the, the uh, talks are going, to be able to collect uh, questions. I will try my best to get to as many of these as I can. Uh, we also have people that are monitoring the chat, so there may be ways to get some information to you through, through just the chat window. Uh, so just a little bit of an introduction to uh, the Architectural Ceramics Assemblies Workshop. Uh, now running into its fifth year, ACAO is one of the most unique architectural workshops that exist internationally. It was conceived as a design residency for architectural firms to educate architects on designing with terracotta through the fabrication of actual prototypes. The residency introduces participants to the materials properties, its fabrication and manufacturing processes, and explorations of digital and analog techniques to design in a contemporary way with this internet in, with this ancient material. The work begins about six months ago, and during that period, the design teams work collaboratively with Boston Valley Terracotta and researchers and students from the University of Buffalo to develop their experimental designs. In the past, the workshop has culminated in a week-long event where the teams working with students construct their assemblies from terracotta parts produced by Boston Valley. They also participate in talks by leading ceramic engineers, uh, skilled digital uh, craftsmen, facade and structural engineers, and keynote addresses by world-class architects. But because of the pandemic, we have opted to do the workshop virtually and thankful uh, that the teams have agreed to take this very material and hands-on event into two days on the internet. So today we have a series of lectures that will inform you of the contemporary building applications of terracotta from its material affordances to its construction to its manufacturing and experimental work in academia happening around it. This will provide a good introduction to teams to the team's research uh, and prototyping that you will see tomorrow. We're especially thankful to Mario uh, Ramirez of Perkins and Wills and Anthony Viola of Adrian Smith and Gordon Gill Architecture, who crafted the Nonagon Virtual Exhibition Hall, where the teams have displayed their prototypes and design processes. You'll have a chance to visit the VR exhibition at the conclusion of today. I'd like to also recognize two of my other co-organizers, Mitchell Brink, who shepherds the team's research process, and Andy Brayman, ceramic art, art artist or extraordinaire who assists in bringing these prototypes to fruition. Without them, this workshop doesn't happen. Finally, the workshop would not be possible without the leadership of Boston Valley Terracotta and the forward vision of its president, John Kraus. John trained as a ceramic engineer and artist at Alfred University, and he brings both of these outlooks to bear on how he runs his company. Our collaboration over 10 years has been inspiring and opened my eyes to the patronage that industry can bring to architectural design, education, and research. With that, let me pass the mic to John uh, to introduce our keynote speaker. First, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Mr. Jamie Von Klumker for so graciously accepting our offer to be this year's keynote speaker. Secondly, I'd also like to thank Robert Shibley, Dean of the School of Architecture and Planning at the University of Buffalo for his continued support. Without the participation of the University of Buffalo, the ACA event would not exist. A big thank you to Omar, our event moderator and newly appointed head of the School of Architecture at Carnegie Mellon, and his continued dedication, and lastly, Mitchell Brain for his everlasting persistence. Without you guys, it would be really difficult to run this show, but thank you so much. As you may or may not already know, Mr. Van Klemker, or Jamie as everybody knows him by, is the president and design principal of Cohn Pedersen Fox, commonly known as KPF, and is currently working on the completion of one Vanderbilt, a super tall tower in Midtown, New York, adjacent to the iconic landmark Grand Central Station. The visionaries at KPF developed an equally iconic masterpiece in record time. 
One Vanderbilt incorporates a beautiful, unique glazed terracotta spandrel into Permastelisa's custom curtain wall system. I could go on and on about the design and the engineering professionals, the general contractors, the owners, the developers, and who all had a part in building this extraordinary skyscraper. But most importantly, I'd also like to acknowledge Anthony Zembri of SL Green and Jan Hilgerman of Heinz. And without their collaboration, this building would not have been possible. I wish everyone the best for the building that will be done on the most iconic skyscraper in the world right here in New York. Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Jamie. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mitchell, and, and thank you, Omar, and uh, thank you to the University of Buffalo and to Boston Valley for uh, arranging uh, this, this wonderful conference and uh, uh, continuing this tradition of, of melding together uh, the, the craft of manufacture and the, uh, the act of design into something we all benefit from. So um, uh, thanks again for inviting me to speak today. This, I think this arrangement uh, came to be during a visit to Boston Valley, uh, as Mitch was explaining, as many of us online uh, have experienced uh, that kind of praxis of bringing together uh, uh, thinking and making uh, in the factory, on the factory floor, and it's where some of the best thinking is actually done and where um, many of the, uh, the examples that I think that we'll talk about, uh, not just in this talk, but in, in the, the workshops that follow, have been born. So um, uh, the necessity ornament, uh, that would be a, a little bit uh, of a play on some other titles of uh, more polemic works. Um, but uh, I do want to show a body of work today that, that ranges from the very small two-story structure to the 100-story tower, uh, uh, partly to emphasize the importance of the intricacy of craft and making things uh, as it, it uh, needs to be incorporated, not only in, in fine, uh, finely scaled objects, but uh, we hope uh, into the making of, of buildings that become major contributors to urban uh, fabric. So uh, next please, Omar. So at the risk of uh, bringing, uh, 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 next slide, um, bringing uh, coals to Newcastle, as they say. Uh, there we go. So go, go to the source, the geographic source, uh, I think of this uh, conference anyway, very, very familiar image and a familiar building and a well-loved building. Uh, which takes us to Louis Sullivan's thoughts about ornament and architecture. Uh, I think the word ornament today, we might use the word uh, materiality, uh, ornament uh, having uh, you know, gathered a kind of uh, patina of, of uh, nostalgic uh, uh, and, and sensitive uh, uh, sort of romanticism around it. The materiality is a little uh, stronger word. Um, but, but still, the degree to which... Uh, the, the kind of impulse of art, of sculpture, of uh, crafting almost, in this case, quite representational forms of, of uh, scrolls, of, of foliage, etc., has uh, come to be one with the building. Interesting to note that uh, Sullivan was quite self-critical of his work, uh, saying in his essay on ornament that uh, uh, why then should we use ornaments? Uh, perhaps we should uh, perforce eschew the undesirable things and learn by contrast how effective it is to think of a building without ornament in a vigorous and wholesome way. He even pr uh, uh, proposed uh, a period of withdrawal from ornament in his, in his own work, that we should uh, separate ourselves for a period of time from this impulse to see what is basic and fundamental about structure, about space, about program, etc. Uh, so, uh, next please. So moving ahead now, because this was about 1895, we go to the young, the image of the young Adolf Loos in Vienna, uh, only about 15 years later. So almost uh, the contemporary of Sullivan. And uh, of course, Loos with his uh, kind of philosophical, radical point of view of culture and making and architecture, uh, uh, wrote about ornament as crime. Uh, as, uh, as he put it, the evolution of culture marches ahead with the elimination of ornament from useful objects. 
Uh, and those thoughts, uh, next please, were uh, uh, hugely influential. And um, uh, next image, uh, we can see incorporated in his Miller house, but also in the Wittgenstein house, or the house that Wittgenstein advised on, uh, Wittgenstein being admirer and friend of Adolf Loos uh, in, in Vienna. Uh, so where was the craft and the ornament uh, in such a building? The kind of absolutism of its reliance on proportion and uh, a crisp form, uh, an abstraction from, uh, from craft and material making. Uh, next, please. So uh, if, if we think about the extrapolation from Loos uh, to the current day, uh, in no uh, uh, purposeful way, but just looking at, at what has resulted, uh, we know that we live uh, and are making cities of glass, uh, the kind of city that uh, New York Mayor Bill de Blasio was uh, inveighing against some months ago, uh, maybe in a reactionary way. Uh, we all understand glass can bring with it its own craft, but there is in such an image a strong implication of a kind of uh, abdication of the role of an architect to express and explore the issues of scale, of meaning, of uh, the meaning of a place, of history, and uh, of a uh, feeling of belonging uh, to one's built surrounding. Next, please. So uh, to set the stage for uh, my going into now a body of work that has been made at KPF, there is, I think, today, and this is not uh, of the most recent, this is probably 15 years old now, the, the uh, uh, Hangzhou School of Art uh, of, of Wangshu and amateur architects, uh, a kind of a strong, strong reaction uh, against the, the abstraction of uh, glass in particular, and uh, Wang Shu's own reaction against the idea of a profession of architecture, hence his coining of the term, or naming of his own firm, amateur architects, uh, and his talking about architecture, as he said, not just an object that you place in an environment, but something that grows from the soul of the surrounding of the kind of materials that come from the ground or come from the forest or from the hands of the workmen who make them. Next, please. And so these uh, terribly evocative images of Wangshu's architecture, uh, of a kind of a, uh, almost a movement, one could say, even though he's a highly uh, individual practitioner, uh, still uh, we live at a time of fascination with returning to craft. Next. So I'd like to, to now go into a, a series of uh, projects uh, from our office, from our firm, where these topics uh, of, of exploring the issues of place, of scale, of the meaning of program are furthered by the, uh, the undertaking of the detail and the careful thinking about material. Next. So I'll begin with a very small building. Uh, this uh, in in the environment or in the, in the background of Coven Garden, this image uh, of a century and a half ago, of the flower markets of Coven Garden, uh, where our office is located and where this project you'll see is situated. Next. So uh, the flower market uh, was partly supported by a, a warehouse for flowers, the little two-story structures sandwiched in between the tower and the next building. Um, so this is where seed pods and uh, flower husks and other things that allowed uh, 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 the English to grow their gardens uh, and the flower market to flourish, where, where this was all housed. Next, please. So our assignment was to take this little building and redo it. You see it there in a kind of a, a, a gray uh, tone uh, before the design, which we now, now built, uh, came to, uh, to reclad that structure. Next. So the idea in, in this project, and you can see a gray, where the actual project is white. Next. Next image, please. Is uh, a, a, a kind of extrapolation of the form and the geometry of a seed pod, these long kind of uh, uh, bowling pin-like forms. Um, so we, we wanted to represent the kind of, uh, literally, the seed of what was inside this building for uh, uh, the last uh, century, starting 50 years before our day today, uh, with a uh, kind of sculpted 
um, panel uh, made of terracotta. Next, please. So this drawn in our office then understood as a, a 3D object, both in drawing and in, in eventually in model. Next, please. And you can see the uh, 3D printing of the negative of this seed pod that was made in smaller scale, explored for its crispness of edge, for its almost graphic qualities. Next, please. And, uh, and then this was, was further within the office uh, with a series of, of pours. Uh, we mimicked, in, in a way, the, the process of manufacture of terracotta, making a positive from a negative and seeing what would emerge. Next, please. And so uh, you can see the, the, uh, the kind of prototype positive, something that needed to be examined and eventually at a larger scale, uh, tooled and refined and glazed. But, but uh, this was the method of, of uh, exploration in our model shop. Next, please. And then uh, eventually it, it came to something which, when refined and finished, uh, was something we could imagine making a facade on Floral Street, a very, very uh, well-trafficked part of, of Covent Garden, of London, and uh, where there was a kind of ge geometric rhythm uh, to these pieces at the micro scale. Next, please. Uh, and then, uh, of course, the, the choice of uh, any one of uh, hundreds of possibilities of glazes, of double glazes, of an underglaze showing through, uh, was intriguing to us, and after all, flowers are colorful uh, things in nature, and shouldn't this seed pod uh, convey something of a sense of color? Next, please. And in the end, we opted for a kind of off-white, mainly because of the power of shadow, of shade and shadow, to show the movement of light across the facade, to show depth, emphasize depth where perhaps only about uh, 15 centimeters is actually uh, incorporated in the casting but um, where where one sees a great bit more and so one gets a facade of a thousand seeds and rhythms which are then even taken up in decorative metal at the parapet level uh, at the top so um, a tiny little project that could be lavished with the attention of, uh, of, of uh, composition and of making something in the studio. Our studio is only about a block and a half away from this facade. So it's, it's kind of a, a natural and organic uh, process of, of client site architect uh, fusion. Next, please. And, uh, and uh, still, a, a, a major impact visually and, and almost uh, something you could run your fingers along as you walk past uh, the building. Uh, and interesting to see it in the context of a classical rustication because you have this sort of organic on the left and, and the classical order being, being more geometric uh, in the center. Next, please. And um, so you can see here this um, sort of undulation and uh, still uh, appreciating, maybe even celebrating the separation of panels. The joint becomes a kind of uh, a subtext of grid running through, uh, which we prefer to show rather than to to downplay. Next, and the straight on view in a strong sunlight. Next, please. And then looking up, uh, the virtue of this sort of sculpted exercise is to see the dynamic of. Uh, uh, view that makes a wave out of something uh, much more static from the from the straight on elevation, and this in in a context of very tightly dimensioned streets of, of Covent Garden. Next, please. So, I'd like to move to another uh, a slightly larger project now. Each of these projects has a very different thesis, as buildings do, as designs do, and the parti then is um, really picked up and embraced by the terracotta, the application of terracotta. So I think the Greeks used the word synecdoche to talk about the connection between the part and the whole. It's a little bit the theme of most of this work. Next, please. So the idea here of the, of the building is one of screens, 
of solids and voids of open and closed form. Uh, it's a building in New York, uh, housing uh, dental and nursing uh, and techno medical technology faculties of NYU. And um, the program is, is quite varied. Uh, next, please. Uh, I believe uh, you could see here an early sketch of how the daylight needs of some program would be counterposed against more solid areas for laboratories. Next. And that program in section here, uh, again, quite a, a kind of uh, a variety of uses stuffed into a uh, 11 story structure. Next, please. And so the terracotta gave us this German terracotta. This is a much more off the shelf, kind of a simple industrial version of terracotta. Uh, but we liked the way that the crispness of the form of the material conveyed this idea of uh, these chiclets of building, uh, single story building elements that almost seem, seem to slide back and forth along the rails of revealed uh, metalwork. Next, please. And so that open and closed dynamic becomes a, uh, uh, something which the terracotta makes possible. The texture of the terracotta being uh, made from scores as well as, uh, as piece joints that are indistinguishable given the way they, they marry uh, intentionally. Next, please. And the depth uh, being achieved in, in on the right-hand side with, with metal reveals for the smaller windows. Next, please. And uh, in some cases then, and you can see the metal reveals here. Next, please. Um, there are bigger returns that happen in terracotta. Uh, Mock-ups showing how the glass in some places comes to the floor. Next. And here the overall building you can see for the larger spaces of aggregate, aggregated functions inside, such as the third floor learning commons, the return is in terracotta as if that material gets to be solid at these more uh, sort of uh, public interface windows. Next. And so the space inside, then a signal by that, that opening up of the facade uh, where all the students hang out in from the different faculties. Next. And um, overall also the, 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 I think, pleasure in this design, a lot of it comes from uh, seeing that the common language of the brick buildings of New York 1930 to today with a lot of buildings from the 1950s is this kind of blonde masonry and the unglazed terracotta echoes and answers something really very rather ordinary uh, in the surrounding and, and that's an important part of, of the intention of the building. Next please. So let's, let's move up now in uh, not so much in scale, but uh, vertical scale, a horizontal scale next to uh, an academic project, which was designed in our office uh, by Bill Pedersen and colleagues. Uh, you could see uh, a series of uh, classroom and student center buildings next to uh, the academic sort of neo-Gothic and neoclassical structures of the University of Michigan. Next. So the theme here, or the idea I want to just, uh, uh, many themes in the building, but I want to draw to everybody's attention, is the theme of color. Uh, the, 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 the more kind of uh, sober color of uh, burnt brown brick, uh, typifying the, the, the uh, existing buildings of the campus, uh, the unglazed clay, uh, the terracotta, the new building, uh, jumps to the fore in its in its redness. Uh, it's arranged in a series of vertical fins and pylons, program elements and massing elements. Uh, next, please. And so, it, what's interesting is uh, that verticality is 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 in part a, a matter of a sculpted architecture of a kind of a stoa outside the main entry of columns. Uh, next, and the colors of the terracotta that are then. Uh, chosen along with a limestone that, that sets it off glass to work in various weather conditions in, in Michigan there's a lot of snow in the winter and that becomes an important consideration of, of the liveliness of the facades and uh, this material as they react over the calendar uh, to the environment next now uh, thinking a little bit about about verticality and color and you can see this sort of essay in facade making, uh, in proportioning and texturing, 
that gives an, an elegant rendition to the solid stairways, to the transparency of, of uh, uh, occupied spaces. Next, please. Um, but, but coming to uh, an idea of, of composition, we look at uh, Bridget Riley painting and think about the, the, the vibrance of uh, here, uh, a wide variety of colors, uh, but the energy and tension when they're sandwiched closely together, uh, always uh, relying on the kind of maniacal consistency of, of verticals in this painting. Next, please. Uh, and so in, in, in this building, uh, we can see the playing off of, of glass panels with terracotta, but the upper range of terracotta made with one material, the difference coming solely from a series of grooves that are fashioned in, uh, with diagonal bias, diagonal one direction, diagonal the other direction, and then a completely flat dressed or, or extruded surface. So when texture becomes color, we feel uh, not just shade and shadow, uh, but something uh, even more playful uh, is, is achieved. And um, uh, it, it makes a blank wall uh, into a painting. Next, please. So the, the, the details here, rather uh, simple, nothing to write home about for those who understand the way terracotta works, but of course, coming together of aluminum clips and frames uh, with a, a, a fairly shallow uh, material, textured material. Next, please. And uh, you could see uh, here a, a bit of a sample in, in a mock-up uh, of the, of the uh, extruded uh, shapes and forms. Next, please. And uh, then a further in a mock-up combined with other elements of aluminum. Um, so there's a kind of a 50-50 uh, play in the, in the palette of, of metal glass and uh, a solid masonry. Next, please. Uh, the, the drawings, I believe these are Jerry Smith's drawings of, of uh, the proportioning and the regularity of the vertical uh, spacing. Next. And uh, the way in which this is achieved, uh, the, I think we all feel very fortunate as architects when we're able to uh, achieve depth, dimensional depth uh, in our architecture. Something that is, as, as those who are practicing uh, know, a, a constant battle of, of uh, the quality of material uh, against uh, the budget of the project, which if it's made into a minimum, often takes away uh, the visual uh, properties and then with it, the meaning of a building. Next, please. Uh, and uh, these uh, motifs are then taken also into the interior of the building, which I think is, is one of the great um, kind of uh, capabilities of the material of terracotta, that uh, its warmth and its tactile uh, kind of welcoming uh, um, feeling uh, makes it uh, just as useful and, and appropriate for this uh, student center uh, gathering space. Next, please which you can see uh, in, in a perspective uh, here. Uh, one of the most lively spaces uh, in the whole university, uh, kind of a, a common area. It's a great piece of sort of a social uh, engineering to create a space like this. Next. And then uh, uh, finally, uh, a view of the exterior to see the kind of crafty way in which a perforated metal has been combined with terracotta. Next, please. So let's let's move on now to uh, the the intention and the idea uh, of rhythm. Uh, uh, next, please. A project in South China in Shenzhen, which is uh, a cluster of about eight buildings. Now uh, about half of them are complete, and uh, they begin with a premise that a grid is the uh, most opportune way to make a city. Uh, whether in the plan of the city, in the nine meter bay systems of the structure, or the unitizing of exterior walls, or the planning of ceiling tiles. It's sort of a, a brute fact, but with that, we, we play within the grid. Next. So you see a series of, sh of shuffles in the grid, but also a simple proportioning of a uh, 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 play on vertical and horizontal, golden section, double square, 
these are all um, basic armatures for larger, uh, well, for buildings that are 30, 40 uh, stories tall, uh, all figure in this piece of town which we are now constructing. Next, please. And so uh, more plays on the grid and, and actual renderings or uh, renderings of the actual wall as it emerged. Next, please. And uh, here you can see a part of this as, as it is being completed. Uh, you see about half of, of, of what constitutes this part of Shenzhen, this new project. Next. And uh, so the use of terracotta here in this rather sober grid city um, this could be taken from uh, the film Alphaville or some kind of, uh, you know, dream of early 20th century grid world, very serious and quite disciplined. Next. And so the, the uh, and, and a piece, if we to, are to zoom in on this, next please, we'll start to see that what makes up the facade is actually a kind of rebellion against the grid. It's a syncopation and an organic shuffling of flutings that are cut and displaced uh, to give a, a kind of uh, uh, an almost an antidote to the extreme seriousness of the rectangular composition of the buildings. Next, please. And so uh, uh, th these are, are made, this is Chinese manufacture, and um, it has a, a, a very interesting kind of an orange peel, a speckled, spotted, uh, 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 glazed finish and an open joint system, uh, even to the point, next please, of allowing pieces of this flute to, to jut out and show it, I'll show you in a minute, an, an empty hollow to the terracotta. Next please. And so uh, you could see here little bits of, uh, if you were to sort of reach your finger up and touch the underside of one of these pieces, you could slip through and discover one of the hollows in the extrusion plan of the material. And then you see also this semi-alligator skin orange peel um, sort of uh, 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 paint or rather uh, uh, a glaze effect which we, which we strive to achieve and which, which happened with a single glaze is interesting to see. Um, so uh, again, the organic is, is celebrated here. Next please. And then to take you back out to the larger scale, to uh, comment on and qualify and play with the grid come the shuffles at the larger scale. The openings of, of uh, uh, upper balcony gardens in uh, the office building to the left, the um, cantilevering out of, of uh, 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 again, sh shuffled forms in this uh, research building that's, that's a kind of a tree house. So uh, it goes back to this idea of uh, imbuing the, the, the thoughts about the grid and the anti-grid at the large scale, the building scale, and at the detail scale, so that there is a, a kind of working together of these two um, aspects of architecture, but with the same sensibility. Uh, next, please. So, um, now we'll, we'll move on to two, I believe, uh, final projects in, in this uh, little talk. Uh, uh, so let's, let's now think about the verticality of a tall building and the capability of, of, of and the natural tendency of, of terracotta as, as uh, in many cases, an extruded material to express uh, the kind of linear striation of, of a one or a one dimension. Next, please. So uh, I'm showing you here a, a tower. Uh, this was created in our firm uh, by uh, uh, a team uh, in New York and in Hong Kong. Uh, my colleagues, Paul Katz, Forth Bagley, are working on this design. Uh, it is a 500 meter tower. So it's, it's a, a rather large, probably about the 10th tallest building in the world. And uh, you could see, next please, um, it is a coming together of a number of functions you see in the, in the colored section of uh, office, of retail, of residential, of hotel. Uh, and with the kind of spliced together vertical arrangements of lifts of elevators, uh, already the, the internal workings of the building are a kind of complex extrusion. Next please. 
And so uh, the form as it was conceived, uh, as a series of, of shuffled volumes that would drop off as the program uh, slimmed down to the residential and hotel, uh, meant that in the macro already, the building was conceived of as this, um, this, this kind of uh, jostled set of extrusions. Next. And uh, so those extrusions then are, are, are echoed at the scale of the mullion. Uh, these are quite large mullions, about 650 mm deep. Uh, they're compound and uh, asymmetrical for a reason, which I'll show you in a second, please, next. And uh, so part of the uh, equation here uh, is a ventilated wall. This has partly to do with the mechanical systems and partly to do the fact that the building emerged during and after the period of SARS, uh, the, 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 the uh, epidemic, which you know, now, now sadly gets uh, maybe, you know, uh, we have our own version today. But uh, how can you bring air through uh, a piece of the building that wants to appear as a solid? Uh, so a marrying of terracotta with uh, a mechanical device. Next, please. And uh, you can see the detail here of the way in which the aluminum uh, extrusion and the terracotta extrusion are uh, clipped and fastened and, and uh, arranged together with corner detail of a more massive sort. Next, please. And, uh, and then the, the glaze uh, is a kind of a raku uh, glaze effect, which is something we we worked very hard to achieve. Uh, it seemed to us to be uh, an interesting way to think about the nature of uh, pottery uh, of uh, Guangzhou of this area uh, in, in its history. And uh, to bring that into a 500 meter tower uh, was uh, intriguing and I think quite beautiful. Uh, and then contrasted with the, the kind of simplicity uh, the refinement of the raku shown against the simplicity of this exposed extrusion of the open joint. Next, please. So the the uh, the material here, as it was procured in China, there was at that stage the building was finished about eight years ago. Uh, quite a doubt uh, in the building community, certainly in the client, as to whether this could be practically achieved without danger. You know, what was the what was this insurable kind of construction? Next, please. And uh, so tests uh, of banging, you know, quite some big weights of metal against the uh, terracotta were, uh, were uh, necessary, not really to, for us to know that the building was going to be sound, but just to prove to all of the doubters. Next, please. And then uh, uh, some of the plays on, uh, on verticality, both in terracotta and aluminum, brought down to the base. Uh, for a kind of splicing together of a symphony of, of vertical uh, stackings, almost like organ pipes, uh, to bring us to the scale of the street and uh, uh, an, upper, an upper podium level here. Next, please. So all in all, um, it's got to be one of the tallest terracotta buildings. Uh, when I say terracotta uh, uh, and height, uh, bringing that material all the way to the top of the building, not, not merely um, as a base, um, but it, it does uh, bring uh, to life this kind of celery stock of, of, of structure, of texture, and um, as we've seen uh, in the detail, a series of echelon ridges in the plan of each one of these uh, verticals that, that brings the part and the whole uh, into the same uh, uh, purpose. Next, please. So we'll now finish on... Uh, 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 talk with um, a show of a project that uh, Mitchell talked about in the beginning of the, his introduction, uh, which is a, uh, a tower which is a few blocks away from where I'm sitting in, in my office, uh, the Vanderbilt uh, Tower. Next, please. And uh, the building sits in the middle of New York. Uh, this is uh, a sketch that I did uh, in the first month or so of the project, looking from Bryant Park at a building which is uh, now the tallest uh, office building in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, our own office is in the foreground here. Um, next, please. But the, 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 
the kind of imperative for us uh, as designers was very much to make this a New York building. Uh, having practiced uh, our our uh, profession as as uh, designers of high rise, which make up about twenty five percent of the work of our office uh, around the world, uh, there's something particular about Manhattan that doesn't easily allow for deviation from the grid. Going back to the idea of a grid, it's if you if you make a building which is on the you know, biased on the diagonal or curved or otherwise shaped, you know, it, it better be uh, Wright's Guggenheim or it better be, there are very few buildings that work as non-grids. And I don't mean only for the planning and economics and the function of the buildings, but even for the form of the city. So this is, a, there is no plan except for one relieved uh, sort of sidewalk uh, easing at the base. Uh, there's no bit of the plan that's not uh, rectilinear uh, in this building. Um, so we think of the grain of the city, the grain of New York. Uh, next, please. And uh, could there be something uh, of a building that was not all glass uh, in this day and age when the economics of the broker's equation and the return on investment for the office leasers uh, demands full views everywhere? The building sits uh, at a kind of uh, crosshair of the center of Manhattan the point where 42nd Street, which we think of as the belt of the body of Manhattan, and uh, one of the major north-south central central spines of Madison Avenue crosses, and maybe even more important, the uh, immediate adjacency to Grand Central Terminal, which, uh, as, as most of, of, of you know, is one of only two uh, transit hubs uh, in uh, New York City, major transit hubs, just Penn Station, Grand Central, unlike the, uh, the, the numerous uh, stations of London or the eight stations of Paris. So super important kind of transit hub uh, functioning and meaning to this building. Next. And its place in the grid. Uh, so here we see quite a, a, a tall tower. It's about 440 meters tall next to uh, the more diminutive but still massive uh, uh, Roman bath uh, design of Grand Central of Warren and Wetmore uh, architects who who delivered the building designed it in 1913. Next, so this relationship becomes uh, very very important, and one of the ways in which we could understand the building could be allowed by zoning was to make a series of uh, data analyses of the way that the indirect sunlight as well as direct sunlight was affected by the tapering of the tower to the point where we could get something that was well beyond the zoning envelope approved. So that, that data um, kind of engineering, which is part of something called uh, KPF Urban Interface uh, here in our office, uh, led to this diagonal form. Next, please. So comparing the uh, more uh, 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 simple geometries of, of a, let's say, a kind of a, a Ferris-inspired setback form in the diagram to the left, the tapering building, tapering in section, tapering at the top of its pinnacle, tapering at the bottom at the uplift of the kind of uh, uh, loggia soffit uh, down at the third story, um, is the, uh, the kind of underlying uh, design structure of the building. Next please. And so uh, it became a great interest to us uh, next to, to, well, this was extended also into the crown of the building. This is a rendering, but it is built today, uh, of a kind of spiraling of diagonal forms, uh, which has a lot to do also with the intersection and, and working as a, a grand central terminal, a building with ramps, a building with <clears throat> all sorts of, of interesting uh, plays on the diagonal. Next. So <clears throat> you can see here this uh, diagonal uplift uh, of the underskirt, uh, if you will, of the building, which then receives a terracotta uh, tiling, which uh, then gives a kind of a, a gesture of warmth, of warm color, uh, of uh, scalloped form and a texture to what amounts to be an urban room in the newly decommissioned street of Vanderbilt Plaza and of the lobby and restaurant spaces inside. Next, please. So um, the surrounding of, the, of uh, what was called once Terminal 
a station a station district, uh, uh, the terminal city of, of, of Grand Central, is full of a kind of delight of art and architecture, of um, just the sort of thing that Louis Sullivan uh, would have understood uh, in spandrel panels and column uh, uh, solids of brick and metal and terracotta and stone. Next, please. Uh, and so it was our hope, and this is the Lincoln Building in the distance, and our the spandrel of Vanderbilt Tower in the foreground, to try to capture in the repetitive texture of the building, both the motif of the diagonal and the, the kind of tactile depth uh, of, of smaller form and of the, of the, uh, the communication of the idea of making things, that these are, these are uh, parts of building made by people, made by tradesmen, made by hand, that can leave their mark on the city just as the bricklayers did in the 1920s. Next, please. So uh, this uh, spandrel became um, kind of the motif of the building. This is a Boston Valley material. Uh, it's shown here at the base of the building in a place where we also needed to incorporate substantial louvering for huge mechanical rooms, hence this kind of uh, uh, back and forth panel of the glass and some aluminum rods that give not really a shading so much as a visual depth to the first uh, 12 stories. Next, please. So the terracotta is, uh, and you can see the, the way the light plays on the material. Uh, in the, the end, at the end of the day, the southern, southwestern uh, angles of the sun playing on a concave scallop give you the kind of parabolic shadow. Uh, this is a, a construction shot, so the glass isn't so clean, but still great. Next, please. And, uh, and then another oblique view showing you the, the, the way the angle of, of, of view changes the perception of patterning from uh, kind of uh, calm to aggressive. Next, please. And then uh, close up. So this material, uh, this, this terracotta, which uh, fortunately the, our proximity to Buffalo means you know, 20 or 30 trips, so we didn't have to think about uh, the travel and we could be uh, with the, uh, the fabricators uh, at will. Um, but it, it's a uh, uh, double fired, double glaze, which creates this kind of luminous effect. There is a, uh, given the viscosity of the glaze, uh, a way in which the, uh, there's a pooling of uh, glaze material and of color in the center, which almost imperceptible on the left, you begin to see it on the right, uh, what this does, and you see it separated with aluminum reglets. Next, please. Um, what this does is is to create in there the, the geometry of uh, uh, the way these laid within uh, pre-made panels for unitized erection. Next, please. Uh, the 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 subtle uh, curve, where with less than two inches to play with, had to count for something. So the glaze almost creates an illusion of greater curvature and depth than really is there. Next, please. So across the, the, the and, and the many, many uh, versions of white, off-white, investigated, and, and you know, the, 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 the great collaboration with, with the, the manufacturers of this material to allow this to happen. Next, please. And then a selection in front of uh, Grand Central to understand that this should be a material that stands apart, but not in a kind of offensively uh, 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 jarring, uh, jarringly different color from the Warren and Wetmore uh, limestone. Next, please. So the color was chosen. Uh, Mock-ups were made at the Permastelisa uh, factories. SL Green, our, our, uh, our client, uh, um, very much uh, with Heinz uh, working with them strongly supporting the idea of craft in the building. Uh, because I think uh, from their point of view, they liked the way it looked, but they also felt it was something of an act of, of good faith to the neighborhood and to the city of New York. Next, please. Because of this echoing of texture and echoing of craft. The assembly uh, on the building as the panels went up, compound panels uh, of uh, spandrel glass and spandrel terracotta. Next, please. 
And uh, ultimately, uh, about a year ago, more of this photograph showing the heroic structure of cantilevers and the way in which a diagonal within the panels of the detail and the diagonal within the larger cantilever are, uh, are pulled together to the same kind of momentum. Next, please. And that, that diagonal is then uh, really, as I mentioned before, a re-evoking of the diagonal movement of escalators coming from the new east side axis, but other, otherwise in older ramps that existed and still exist today from the lower concourse to the upper, what is known as the Kitty Kelly ramp. So uh, buildings which are diagonal in their anatomy and also uh, in this case in exterior form. Next, please. And uh, just close to finishing now, uh, one of the, the kind of fascinations uh, in this exercise, in this building, is the uh, um, uh, almost, uh, not re-quotation, but, but, but the, the reminder of the Guastavino tile, which uh, this is now under the 59th Street Bridge, but Guastavino, the, the Barcelona uh, uh, engineer and, and producer of great tile structures um, made a, a, a kind of a unique set of contributions to the city of New York. Uh, this, we're trying to, to think about how we could remind ourselves of the, the Grand Central tile in our terracotta panels. Next, please. And uh, the view from the viaduct, the second, second story, uh, uh, a bit of infrastructure looking at the the uh, lobby of the building, next please. Uh, the selection of a lobby tile, which would be a, a warmer uh, terracotta, I guess you'd say color, terracotta, colored terracotta, but a, a kind of a burnt red. Next please. A, uh, uh, a rendering of the lobby showing that ceiling and showing a piece of art in bronze, which we designed within the firm uh, and showing a, a kind of a, 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 a way in which terracotta became the takeoff point for thinking even further about art and architecture, where one wouldn't draw a line between the two disciplines. Next. And then finally, uh, a shot that I took yesterday on site, looking at some other mock-ups of the ceiling of the Grand Central Terminal of Warren and Wetmore uh, beyond the Chrysler Building poking its head in between. Next, please. And uh, the pieces of, of metal which are going up against the wall, not terracotta, but a kind of a, a, a sister bit of exploration of, uh, of art in architecture, of, of craft in building, which gives another dimension uh, to the space. Uh, so I want to finish on the next image, which is uh, just a kind of a collage uh, with a telephoto lens uh, of those heroic figures on the pediment of, of 1913 building and seen against uh, facade uh, today of, of, uh, of Vanderbilt and thinking in the, in, in back in reference to the, the, the ideas and expressions of Louis Sullivan, of uh, Adolf Loos, of, uh, of that, that kind of um, debate in practice of, of the place of craft, the place of art uh, in the context of architecture and how um, part of our mission, I think, in, in, in the conference is, is to, to, uh, to make great things out of the, uh, out of the marriage of the two, uh, e even in this uh, modern day when we don't have armies of Beaux-Arts uh, sculptors to, to decorate our structures. Um, but uh, so that's, that's my uh, review of, of, of five or six projects. And uh, sorry if it ran over, we began a little late, but um, thank you. Thank you, uh, Jamie. Uh, let me see if we have some questions here for you. Um, let me maybe just start, uh, so, so for the attendees, if you can just in the chat window, uh, give us some questions, uh, we can pass those on to, to Jamie. Jamie, I just wanted to bring up, just uh, this is wonderful uh, concluding slide, but uh, the term, uh, maybe an expression you started, the liveliness of the facade was a, a kind of a, an expression you had as you were describing, I think the rhythm uh, uh, 
part, when you're talking about color specifically, uh, I think there's an increasing interest in, uh, yes, the facade, and the facade is now beginning to become uh, the site for meaning. Uh, but this liveliness has uh, uh, many more intensities, as you're suggesting here. It's not the symbolic liveliness that perhaps, I mean, even with Sullivan, it was a little bit towards an abstraction. Uh, but, but in your case, there's a certain level of abstraction. But I'm also a little bit curious about also the environmental questions, for instance, now facades, these high performing facades where you're integrating a lot of systems and so forth. Do you think uh, some of your sensibility is also tied to those kinds of issues and concerns? Uh, uh, and, and is that where also liveliness could be found a bit more? Yeah, and, and I think, uh, thank you, Omar. It's a, it's a, it's a great question, an interesting question, uh, which has so much to do with the place of, of the climate uh, of, of uh, because the facade's role in, in, in tempering the use of energy um, uh, means, I think some of the, the most uh, sort of aggressive facades uh, in, in our work that have uh, played a big role in, in, in environmental performance happen in southern climates or even equatorial climates in Singapore, in Jakarta, with mm. one meter deep sunshades and with, with very different... Uh, uh, east-west versus north-south uh, treatments, uh, 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 you know, given angles of the sun. So I think, you know, in, in New York, we're, we're in a relatively benign climate, and there's a lot of self-shading of buildings, too. Uh, so that, that actually, <clears throat> the, I, I think if we asked ourselves this question 20 years ago, we would have come back with a lot more active profile answers to, to mm. this challenge of, of how to temper the building, protect it from the sun. Uh, and then maybe 15 years ago, 10 years ago even, we might have talked about double facades, about ventilated mm. facades. Still possible maybe to make a difference in some European climates. But by and large, um, I think what, what we find, and I imagine colleagues on the line do too, that the coatings of glass are, are, are doing most of the work in yeah. uh, achieving a shading coefficient, keeping the, you know, the, the, the radiant heat out of the building and getting visible daylight uh, into the building for, for use you know, so these artificial lights all the time. So from an energy point of view, interestingly, a simple facade is often, and an unarticulated facade, the, the right. most um, you know, efficacious. Um, there are other uh, environmental issues, of course, having to do with, with the material, the, the embedded uh, uh, the aluminum is not, is, is not the best, it's often the worst uh, of, uh, in the scale of embedded energy. Uh, terracotta, it stands to reason, you have to fire it once, but it, uh, it comes from the ground. And so there's something um, probably quite environmentally friendly about, about that material. Uh, just one question, uh, Jamie. I, unfortunately, we're running out of time here, but I thought it would be an important one, this one. Uh, this had to do with how do you ease the client into an ornament material conversation? Uh, what is the opportunity cost for them? This is from Pedro uh, Pinera Rodriguez. Yeah. Well, it's a fundamental question for uh, particular for larger scale buildings. With sums, you know, these are economic machines. They're kind of uh, frightening when it comes to the amount of of, uh, of money that it takes to, to build such a building and that, you know, that the building yields in the end. So um, I think, I think a, a lot of this has to do with uh, uh, un appealing to uh, the sense of responsibility to the context of a city, which I, I think you know, I alluded to earlier, that we are all uh, making with such structures, uh, in a way, public property. Uh, mm -hmm. the, 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 the facade is, is you know, out of, outside of a building, but it's part of a, a skyline, part of the envelope of the square or of, of, a, of a street. And, and I think the, um, the kind of uh, going too far in the direction of the glass city, I mean, it was interesting to Bruno Taut, and it was interesting to me, so interesting to you know, many of us, for, for even recently, but I think we, we realized at a certain point that, that we, we make uh, swaths of cities uh, with, that have no meaning, that, ha that do not communicate. And, you know, architecture's role, it's not as if architecture's only role is, is narrative, but it has an important 
uh, uh, great importance in in the aggregate of, of, of building after building after building. So, uh, in a process of kind of mutual education with the client, the projects take long enough where you can actually go through the equivalent with our clients of a graduate course in talking about why and how <laughs> buildings of, of material quality pay back. Uh, they have a kind of, you know, we'd all rather uh, live or, or rent a building in a district that has uh, a character of, you know, cast iron buildings of Soho, New York, rather than maybe some of the more drab stretches of, I won't name where and which city, but we're all familiar with them. Uh, and I think in particular in this age of the prominence of the technology company, the quality of life in the quality of, of work and the kind of humanizing of the workplace gives us a leg up in this discussion about, about uh, the quality of facades. Um, the reference to natural materials is, I think, welcomed as themes of health come into the building. It's just kind of a... a, a uh, kind of a, a, a narrative theme that goes together with a performative or uh, an actual physical quality of, of building materials. Uh, but I think the question is, is really, really important because it, it's a, a constant um, sort of <clears throat> about to, and I think those who have succeeded, uh, you know, have given us amazing structures. Think of uh, Renzo Piano's uh, Times Tower or um, any number of, of buildings where I, I think we find today in the practice of the last five years and, and what's coming ahead, a kind of a renaissance of appreciation, of depth, of solidity, and of that kind of uh, emotional response. You could almost call it emotional performance of a building. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jamie, uh, very much. Uh, we have a few more questions, but uh, perhaps we can uh, pass those on to you and then uh, uh, get uh, people responses and post those afterwards. Okay. Uh, thanks again for, for uh, a wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you so much. It's great to be here.